Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm hearing some feedback. Everyone go on mute. Just stay much better. OK. Welcome, everyone. I am Holly Corbett. I'm the director of content at Consciously Unbiased. It's a movement to build belonging in the workplace. And today, the topic of our LinkedIn Live is, why don't workers want to go back to the office? So we're hearing a lot of news about the great resignation where we're seeing a, a trend in employees quitting their jobs. Um, a recent Gallup poll found that as many as 48% of American workers are actively seeking other positions. Um, so there's many reasons behind this trend, such as the pandemic fatigue, a labor shortage, and also the fact that more employers are calling their employees back to the office. Um, in fact, as many as one, one in three employees are saying they'll quit if they have to go back to the office. So we have some amazing panelists here uh, to talk about this today. So we'll start off by introducing our guests. Um, could each of you say who you are, what you do, and what you're hearing from your own clients as being some of the biggest reasons behind this trend of the great resignation. Um, Dr. Plummer, do you want to start? Absolutely. I am so excited to be here. I am Dr. Linnell Plummer, the CEO of Onyx Therapy Group, which is a mental health company headquartered in Washington, D.C. We're nine offices in four states and love to focus on mental health. So one of the main things that we're seeing across our client base in terms of the conversation around returning back to work and maybe some anxiety that's being built is that many folks are deciding to resign as a employment boundary. They believe that it's important for them to be able to, they, they know that they have the skill set and the capabilities to do the work and to likely do it from home or to do it from remote places that allow for them to balance out and have harmony in their mental health. Sometimes the workplace in itself causes stress, whether it's related to the commute or some of the interactions that are happening between colleagues or some micro uh, microaggressions or some micromanagement. And when they're able to work remotely, they have a little bit more freedom and a lot more control over their mental health. And when they're not given that opportunity, they feel devalued and, uh, and less supported. And recognizing that there's other companies that could potentially allow them to do remote work and to still be successful. So what we're finding is that many of them are coming to therapy and processing what it would look like if they resign from their positions that are forcing them to go back into the office, more so because they believe that they can have more harmony in their work-life balance and more in their physical and mental health balance and productivity if they're allowed to continue to remain re remote. Great. So you're saying it's a boundary? Yeah, um, definitely around the boundary because they're able to see that they're still they're able to produce the work. The things that are listed in their job description are um, areas of their performance evaluation. They're able to do it and do it at home or to do it, you know, in the mountains or do it at the beach or do it next to their aging parents or do it next to their toddlers. They're able to still do it and have balance. Um, and not necessarily have to go into the office. And I know we'll talk about it a little bit later, but sometimes the environment has a major impact on, on our mental health as well. And sometimes mm -hmm. office environments are not conducive. <coughs> Excuse me, sometimes office environments are not conducive to mental health. Mm, thank you. Julius, do you want to go next? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, hello, everyone. Julius Boatwright here. I am the founder and managing director of Still Smiling, 
So we are a community-based nonprofit organization here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we focus primarily on black mental health and connecting folks to the appropriate level of supports and services that they need. And I would just echo what Dr. Plummer said in, in her answer. I feel like I'll likely be doing that a lot because Dr. Plummer makes excellent points all the time, but people are really taking ownership uh, over of valuing their own self-care, uh, mental, psychological, spiritual well-being. And folks are realizing that they can take care of themselves better at home, right? Like Dr. Palmer said, they can be there for their family members. They can be there more for themselves. And if it's something that you can do at home in your own space, then why, why not encourage that? And why not adapt to that change in employee behavior? Mm. Great point. And, and Christy, how about you? Well, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm excited to talk about this topic, which uh, has has honestly become been coming up every day in conversations I'm having with uh, workers and leaders and managers. But I'm Christy Wallace, the CEO of Elevate Network, which is the largest community of women in the workplace. We span function, geography, career stage, and more, and really look to provide the support and community that women need to thrive and succeed at work. Uh, something that has been top of mind for, for our community during this time is really uncertainty. And the idea of going back to a workplace when other things are so uncertain, school closures, uh, health and wellness of those in your community, what's happening in this world, it feels a little bit forced um, because there's so many other factors and variables that you are contending with. And so the idea of then adding, you know, these guardrails, which in many ways guardrails um, are helpful, they provide direction, um, can be a little stifling when you're trying to understand what the future looks like uh, when we've seen the past year and a half to be so uncertain. Yeah, and things keep changing, you know, just when we think we're, we've kind of gotten through it a little, uh, again, it switches up with the Delta variant. So I think that that ongoing uncertainty is fueling a lot of anxiety. It's hard not to be able to plan, not know what's going to be able to happen next. So thanks for that point. And Tuska, last but of course not least, love to hear from you. Thank you, thank you. And also a pleasure to be here with these uh, amazing panelists and excited for this, uh, what I know will be a deeper dive conversation about this important topic. Um, so I'm Tosca DiMatteo, founder of Tosca Coaching and Consulting. I spent 20 years in corporate environments and the very last thing that I did before I left was try to create a position um, to help the organization with culture. And that wasn't um, something they were interested in at the time. So I am on the outside now um, as a corporate whisperer, helping uh, organizations to create human-centric workplaces. Um, and oh boy, is there so much to work to do with that. Um, and in answer to your question, you know, I think um, everybody's comments around boundaries and guardrails and mental health all plays a role. And I think I just, I lather it all up to People are having an awakening, an awakening to their own power to say, you know what, maybe I don't have to sacrifice so much. Maybe actually I can dig into my truth a little bit and find out what I need and want and actually honor that. You know, because I think companies have operating for has, have been operating so long on the basis that like employees are lucky to be here. And now employees are like, you know what, maybe it's a little bit more of an abundance mindset to say, hey, I can find something that actually works for me and I'm going to go find that. And there will be workplaces that that accommodate. So that's my take on, on why people are leaving. They're waking up and they're saying, I'm taking my power back. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. I, I wrote a Forbes story where I wrote people are now switching from uh, live to work to a work to live mindset. And I think this has been a collective crisis. Whenever we experience crisis on an individual level, it, it requires us to, take a step back and, and think about what matters most. And this has been such an unprecedented and historical moment where globally we have had to take a step back and really think about things. And in a way we've gotten some space to do that as we've kind of slowed down on, on doing so much. Um, but on another note, we've 
also been busier than ever plugged in, which we will get to today. We've got a lot to unpack. Um, but I'd love to just get your opinion on, as, as we're hearing all this news of the Great Resignation, what do you think are some of the mi biggest misconceptions about why the Great Resignation is taking place, about why people are, are quitting in such big numbers? You know, it's interesting it's, it's, that you say that, Holly. One of the things that I that always makes me laugh is when someone says, "Well, people are quitting because they have all the this government support, right? The government stepped in and helped out a lot when folks were um, forced into unemployment for various reasons." And so I'm often hearing people say, "Well, if the government stops giving support, then people are going to go back to work." And it's interesting, it's not those folks who are necessarily the ones that are resigning, right? It's actually folks who have been working um, through this pandemic and who are now being forced to go back into offices or into workspaces or into environments that weren't conducive to their own uh, self-care. The other interesting thing that took place during this pandemic is that so many people started focusing on self-care because they could. They started taking midday walks. They started eating differently. They started paying attention to their sensory experiences, what they were looking at, what they were hearing. And they found fulfillment and contentment and satisfaction. And nobody wants to give that up. Nobody wants to give up the fact that they can't look at their plants throughout the day because plants aren't allowed in the office or that they can't go out for a walk um, because their break is only 15 minutes when it actually could be 30. And so people are starting to grieve the loss of self. You're telling me I'm going to lose elements of myself. I'm going to lose my satisfaction and my contentment just so I could be in a building so that you can potentially micromanage me. And some, some industries do require us to be face-to-face. -face. In mental health, there is a large preference of being face-to-face -face because you can interact with your clients a little differently. But that's not the case in all industries, right? And so some of us as employers, our supervisors need to be considering that our employees may be resigning because they're grieving the potential loss of self. They're grieving the potential loss of self-care. They're grieving the potential loss of satisfaction and they don't want to give that up and they don't have to give that up because there's other companies that will allow them to be successful, use their skills and talent and still prioritize their, their self, their care and their mental health. You just actually answered my, my next question. I mean, while some people really welcome going back to the office, the reason for those who dread going back to the office, it's varied, it's personal and, and, I'd love to hear from the rest of you. Um, what are some of the reasons you're hearing from your clients on why people don't want to go back to the physical office? Well, I, I'll jump in. I mean, I think, you know, and, and also to touch on some of the misconceptions that are out there is one that, you know, being in an office five days a week, eight plus hours a day is the right way to be. I mean, why is that structure in place? The structure is in place because it's always been there and we've just continued to keep it going. And we are in, I think, a very unique time where we can really evaluate those structures and, and why do they exist and what really works for us as a society, for our employees, for our company. And so there's that's one aspect of one questioning those structures. Like why? Why go back to office? Why not a hybrid? Why not some other structure that works best for your organization? I think a year and a half ago, if we had said everyone was gonna work remotely, um, that would seem ludicrous to many, but we've done it and we've done it pretty successfully. So question those structures, just don't slide back into what existed before. And, and also, you know, a misconception is that companies can't do anything about the great resignation. I think that's completely untrue. There's a lot companies can do. And part of that is looking at your employees for who they are as humans as humans with a diverse array of needs, identities, expectations, and experiences? And how do you put the employees first and align that with what you as a business leader are trying to do? What do they need? How do you motivate them? How do you keep them inspired and engaged and see that the impact that will then have on your ability to not only hit business objectives, but to keep employees within your organization and to keep them supported and engaged and moving forward. Uh, so there's a lot there that I think is really an important aspect to think about as we go back to this conversation of going back to the workplace. 
Um, and you know, some of the reasons too that people are, are hesitant to do it. I mentioned uncertainty before. Um, I'm a mom of three. I my have no idea what's going to happen when school goes back in. Some of my support structures have gone away uh, during this time. So I, I am trying to figure that out. Um, we're a little bit shell shocked from, from what has happened over the past you know, year and a half. So, you know, as we think about why people may or may not want to go back in and, and to be fair, many people do want that in office experience. I think it's understanding um, really what's the, you know, minimum viable situation what uh, does your workforce need to be human and to be supported? And how can you move forward in a way that's maybe new and different uh, than the way you did it before? Yeah, and I think you really hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, the workplace rules, maybe they need to be changed. They were written a long time ago, and, and now it's time to adapt and transform to the new environment. And the fact that you know, the digital era allows us to be able to do so much outside of the office is, is key. Um, Tusker, Julius, do you have anything to add to that? I do. The last point you just said, Holly, about sort of the, the way that things are transitioning and this shift with the way that we do business, I think that's one of the bigger things that we need to, to find a deeper understanding for because we're almost like, I, dare I say, like grieving the way that we've done business before. So we, you know, there's there's different stages of grief, and I think as executives and policymakers and uh, HR representatives, we're now having to reimagine what efficiency looks like, what processes look like, and how we include like emotional intelligence and empathy into those processes. I mean, we we've heard time and time again that right, this new generation. And it's usually like uh, not a strengths-based way of referring to the new generation. Well, the new generation doesn't want to work. The new generation doesn't want to do this or that. And it's not that's not the truth. It's that the new generation is redefining the way in which they do work, using technology um, to leverage those things, and still having a high level of emotional intelligence at the core of those uh, policies and practices as well. So I think we, we, we have to be mindful and intentional about the grieving process of what was, and then sort of this uh, this reimagining and reemerging of what is now and what will, what will be in the future. Yeah, Julius, and I think, you know, in the quote unquote old workplace, um, emotional intelligence wasn't as highly valued, but I've been reading all this research that says EQ is an even higher predictor of success in the workplace than IQ. So really focusing on the development of EQ and leaders who have EQ is, is so important, especially as we're transitioning in these uncertain times. Tosca, what about you? Yeah, you know, I just, I think everything, you know, around the archaic way of doing things, questioning status quo, like all of these things, you know, the grieving um, are very important. I also think, you know, it comes down to our, our employees being seen. And if they're not being seen in the workplace and then they're at home and they can have a better kind of mental health situation, right? Because they're in their space and they can, um, you know, be in the vibe that serves them, you know, then why go back to an office where they never felt seen in the first place? Not to mention all the added burdens that have been placed on, unfortunately, people of color that, that are not being, you know, um, financially rewarded or otherwise, or even given added resources for doing, you know, for kind of like being re-traumatized in some cases because they're being asked to do the work of, you know, PR and those types of things. And so it's like, if you've been overtaxed over the past year and a half, and now the company kind of seemingly wants more from you without really addressing, like, how do we help employees feel safe? How do we give them what they need that looks like beyond the benefits of, of 401k or the, or the basics? Like, how do we actually maybe help people with somatic work or other modalities, you know, beyond some of the, you know, traditional things? Uh, I think that all of this plays a role in terms of, you know, companies basically have not taken the lead 
on ensuring they're doing the right things. And now is the moment where you either say, okay, like I'm putting my money where my mouth is and I'm putting my employees first, or they're going to continue to see people go to places where they can feel more seen and they can feel like they belong. So Tosca, what are some ways that companies can take the lead in figuring out what their employees need during this time and delivering it to them? You know, I think a big way that they can take a lead is dismantling what I believe is like the number one uh, factor that suppresses people and 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 takes away the magic and kind of strips people from the magic. And what that is 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 get rid of this paradigm model of power over that leaders use, like without even thinking about it, to really say, how do I share power? How do I really do my own work? You know, how am I empathetic with myself so I can be empathetic with the folks that I'm working with? Um, you know, and the list goes on and on. But I think that the power over structure and it also requires some some education and some learning for a lot of folks out there who only know one way to lead. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot other there's a lot of other ways that we need to be leaning into right now to 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 create more human centric workplaces. Yeah, Holly. It yeah. If I could add in to, to my fellow Virgo here, I'd also say um, that we need employers need to be trusting the people that they hire. When they hire the employees, they're hiring them to do a particular job, to use their skill set, to use their talent, and recognizing that they're humans as well. And I find that a lot of micromanagement occurs because managers and supervisors don't necessarily have trust in the experience with their employees. And because of that, they believe that um, if I don't trust you, and they, no one says that aloud, right? Because that's not that's not professional, and it, it it sounds very toxic. But they they demonstrate it in their behaviors, and it may even be a subconscious thought that just kind of carries over and comes out. But I believe that if employers started trusting the people that they hired more, then we would be in a different circumstance, which means that there probably needs to be a shift in the HR process, in the interviewing process, the recruiting process, um, the questions that are being asked, so that we're not asking questions just about a person's skill set or talent, but about the essence of who a person is, because that is what this pandemic has brought forward. We are now looking at our staff members and our employees as humans, right? In the mental health field, we've always done that, but looking at people as humans and the essence of who they are and their unique um, qualities and experiences and how they bring that into the workplace. And so I believe that some of the shifts may need to happen, not just in the mindset of the supervisors and employers, but in the structure of the HR departments and the recruiting processes as well. Yeah, and, uh, thinking um, I more, Dr. Plummer, and I also, um, I think another aspect of that, and as we look at the recruitment, is also the retention piece of it, right? And so, yes, it's management, it's trust. I mean, trust is, I think, central to human relationships, and it's not something that's given easily within workplaces. Um, but there's also the interpersonal connections. You know, when we talk about, and, and my work is really looking at, you know, women in the workplace and, and women of colors and how we continue to move forward. And a big barrier has always been, you know, who's in the room, who has the voice at the table, who is, you know, at that networking event or getting the opportunity with some of the decision makers. And that's something that has been kept from us for way too long. And as we look to the future of these hybrid workplaces or virtual workplaces, who's again, not in the room, whose voice isn't heard, who's more, inclined or maybe has more privilege to be able to be back in person in an office versus who's home with other responsibilities or keeping their family safe. What are those decisions that they're making? And so as companies are looking again, not just at the recruitment piece of it, but it's the retention. How are you building those connections, that informal mentoring, that support within your organization? You have to be much more intentional about that now. It's not running into someone in the kitchen around the virtual, you know, the essential water cooler. It's about you know, really understanding the structure of your organization, how you're building in some systems to ensure that connections are made, that conversations are being had, that your employees are supported wherever they are. And that's something we've heard uh, quite often from the women in our community is that over the past, you know, year and a half, they feel like they've lost touch with leadership, that when they're at a a virtual meeting, they don't know how to, you know, have their voice heard because a lot of those physical cues are no longer there. 
um, that they're not getting the face time with decision makers and losing out on opportunities. And so that's a big piece of company intentionality that we need to be able to say, okay, what are these structures going to look like? And then how do we put in the work to ensure that we're not sliding backwards on the progress, uh, which we still need to be making, um, to support our employees, to diversify our workforce, and to create access to opportunities for all. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, um, how do you do that? How in this, you know, the traditional workplace was people sitting at a desk for knowledge workers between nine to five or nine to six, and now that's no longer the case. And we spend a lot of time in front of our computers. I've seen a lot of companies doing virtual happy hours, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. I think that's fizzled out because we've been spending so much time in front of our computer. But can you offer advice on how to really build those connections and um, an environment where everybody's voice can be heard and people are seen when we're not physically together face to face? And I can share some of the things uh, we've been doing at Elevate, and we've also been doing this with our corporate partners and the companies that we work with. Um, so one is, you know, we started doing at the beginning of the pandemic, these weekly roundtables. Uh, there's uh, always kind of a hook. There's a topic, a topic that's relevant to you individually, if that's setting boundaries, relevant to you as a manager, if that's how to support your team and better communicate in a virtual environment. Maybe something that matters to you as, as a human and, and your greater impact on the world. Um, but we tee it up with a, a quick, you know, peer uh, enlightenment or conversation on the topic, something that's going to set the stage. But we always go into smaller breakout rooms, uh, take that topic deeper into our own personal experience and lives and build connections with others. So that's something that's really um, been, you know, we've been struggling with during this time is those kind of how are we continuing to connect with others, to have conversations that are meaningful, that aren't passive. You know, happy hours can be tough because maybe you're just sitting there on the screen watching, you know, other people drink. Maybe you don't drink. Maybe you have work to do. You have other responsibilities. But this is something where it's about your personal and professional development, giving the space that you need to have these conversations, to learn from peers, to build deeper relationships. And these are all things that, that companies can do. How are you making the space? At, at Elevate, we um, created community hours for our team to come together and process what's happening in the world, to make space for that. Because when you walk into an office, whether it's a virtual office or an in-person office, you don't leave your identity at the door. The world doesn't stop. And so being able to talk about that in an open and honest forum with your colleagues makes you feel more connected, makes you feel less alone. Um, there's a number of examples of just how are you starting to make those spaces um, to acknowledge the humanness that is in your workplace and to provide that support and awareness. But when you think one-on-one -on -one as well, and you look across uh, you know, the structure of your organization, it's really important for leaders, for managers, to be very intentional about who aren't you seeing every week, who's not at your regular meetings, who's not you know, at, at those virtual spaces that you're in, and reach out to them. Be, plan that in your calendar. Put it in your calendar every week. Who should I be reaching out to? Ask your HR team. Ask your other direct reports. Who should I be connecting with? And, and be very intentional about that and not just pinpoint a, a select few because there's a lot of bias that goes into that, but everyone within that structure and that organization that you can meet with to show, one, that you're listening and that you care, and two, to build that rapport and connection that will serve that individual as they move forward in their career. Yeah, so it's about just being very intentional in reaching out to people and also maybe not just making it all about work, like making time to not have a work agenda during your, your call and check in and see how people are doing. Um, I think that's so important during, during this time. Does anybody else have anything they want to say? I would agree and echo that sentiment that Christy brought up. Um, having those conversations that aren't solely focused on the bottom line and activities and, and outcomes and outputs, because we're, we're having those conversations 90% of the time, right? Um, and I found that I've learned the most valuable pieces of information about our staff people and our team members and consultants when we in the first five minutes of the conversations and the last five minutes when someone starts talking about their weekend plans or how they have to travel to take care of a, 
a sick or ill family member, they start to bring those things up. And if you don't give, uh, if you don't make enough space intentionally to talk about those two, to whatever degree they're comfortable talking about them and sharing, then you will never be able to get that information to be able to figure out how you could best support, lead and manage that individual, right? So um, I, I just can't, I can't say enough of what Christy mentioned about being intentional about making that time to have those conversations. And, and a, a second piece of that point I wanna add is that um, I think we need to challenge this narrative that talking about one's emotions in the workplace is a sign of weakness and that it, it, it somehow indicates that you can't be a um, high performer on a consistent basis because you're too emotional Right? We don't know if you'll be able to, de to deliver, if your mental health will get in the way. I think it's uh, it actually the opposite narrative we need to start to adapt and uplift is that when people are, are emotionally vulnerable um, and they are sharing those moments with folks and those vulnerabilities, it, it shows how courageous they are and how much strength they have and how they can actually deliver in the most difficult of situations and circumstances. So I think it's it's also up to employers to start uh, making space for those narratives to be uplifted and celebrated as well. Absolutely. I, I keep doing this, right, Holly? I'm like, this is so good. I, I, this is great. <laughs> With what Julius was saying, it, it goes back to this, I, the concept of emotional intelligence, which is what we were talking about a few minutes ago, right? And, and the articles and books that you've been reading about it, Holly, in that the emotional intelligence is what really drives connections. And when we know that people feel connected and they feel empowered and they feel valued, that's when they have the best productivity. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in an office. It doesn't necessarily have to be in one station place because the creative, the creative juices and the innovation and the thoughts, they have it in all sorts of places. One can be out on a walk and have a wonderful idea and create a plan right there on that walk and make something beautiful for their company, something uh, that's extremely productive. So if we started valuing uh, the humans more and the human experience and the emotions that come with it, like Julius is saying, then I think we're gonna have higher retention um, and we're gonna have people who are more engaged and more and higher morale in the workplace. And and that way you're gonna they're gonna get the the um the bottom line met. The productivity is always gonna be there when the human is valued more than the product. Always. It's always gonna happen because people are gonna feel seen and empowered and they're gonna wanna give back to those people who make them feel seen. They're gonna it's a sense of reciprocity that comes with that human experience. If you see me and you make me feel good, I want you to see more of me. And in order to do that, I'm gonna give more to you and I see you and it's this flow that happens. And when employers and supervisors are just focused on outcomes and not um, person-centered, then, then they lose folks, right? And not only do they lose folks, they lose product, they lose revenue, they lose reputation and, and so much more. So it, I guess the major takeaway for me is if people could just start valuing the humans that are working with them and not just the skills that that human possesses, then we're gonna see that people feel more valued at work and everybody is gonna have this sense of harmony in the, in the place. Right. And I mean, business is, of course, about the bottom line. But the truth is, is that if people, you know, people are a company's greatest resource. So if you're investing in people, if you're making them feel safe, if you're making them feel heard, they're going to be happier, more engaged and more productive, um, which is good, of course, for the company. But what about for in terms of creating space to better address emotions in the office? Any guidance? for managers or leaders on how to do that? Is there, a, you know, questions to make a habit of asking or something that you can do in the way that you show up? Just some guidance, because this is new territory for a lot of people. A lot of us aren't used to sharing um, personal things in a work environment, but it's hard not to now with the pandemic collectively impacting us all and everybody seeing each other's lives on Zoom. You know, I'm not, if I can jump in, you know, I, I think that leaders can't ask their employees to do things that they're not willing to do themselves. You know, so I think that 
that and and I consider a leader. You are a leader wherever you are in in, in the organization, right? You have the power wherever you stand, whatever your title is. But I think that you know to ask questions um, that go deeper than what did you do this weekend that really get at what are you feeling, what are you experiencing, what are your pain points that that we have to be willing to ask ourselves and know and know the answer and be willing to hold space in non-judgment for whatever comes up without having to solve for it either, right? Without having to fix, but just to, just to say, I just want to hear, right? And then, and then you can, you can decide what, is there something in that, that you can impact is, you know, is there something in there that's your responsibility? But I feel like to create spaces that are psychologically safe, where people can trust that what they share isn't going to come back and bite them in the butt, um, that leaders have to be willing to do their own work, their own inner work to understand what's going on with them so that they can hold space for others. Because if we're not empathetic with ourselves, how can we possibly be, you know, hold space for others? So, and, and that, you know, that kind of comes down to getting the support that you need, um, mm -hmm. whether that's coaching, whether that's training and development, whatever that is, um, so that you can start to, you can be willing to sit in uncomfortable conversations because that is the right thing to do. And that is how we bring humanity forward by being willing to sit in the discomfort and discover what is there for us. That is maybe beautiful and maybe messy, but it's not all going to be pretty. And I think that because we're dealing with humanity, that's part of what we have to realize. This isn't going to be a gloss over, you know, this, you know, to do the real work, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. So, you know, uh, how, how can we um, set ourselves up to be okay with that? So Tosca, it sounds like you're, it's about creating space to process and discover answers for ourselves in order to be able then to in turn hold the space to help employees or team members process. Um, but I, it's, I think that it, we're seeing a lot more burnout now um, during the pandemic. And I'm wondering what employees can do to better safeguard their mental health and also what companies can do to help support employees. Yeah, I mean, I know we, we have mental health experts here. I think what I'll just say about that is that, you know, when individuals, right, also it's the same thing, you know, to, to understand yourself, to understand what you need. Just that question alone, I think can be life changing to just stop and say, I'm feeling triggered today. I'm struggling. I'm really emotional. Like, what do I need? But I'll, I'll hand it over to my colleagues here that probably have much deeper responses to that question. I, I think, um, Holly, to that particular question for me, it's as simple as thinking about some simple ABCs, right? So um, when we're looking at employees and safeguarding mental health and what employers need to do, one of, some of the things we need to be paying attention to is teaching employees how to advocate for themselves based off of their awareness, right? So those would be the A's. One, be aware of what your needs are. Be aware of what makes you more productive. Be aware of what makes you feel valued and safe because then you're gonna take that information and you're gonna advocate for yourself. You can't come, you can't approach a problem without a solution. So, and that solution comes in the form of advocacy, right? I think the next piece are those B's, those boundaries and behaviors. One thing that I uh, notice and I really emphasize with my clients is that no one is going to respect your boundaries if you don't respect your own boundaries. If you set a boundary to say I'm off work at four and then you're still responding to emails at 430, you cannot be surprised when your boss sends you a response at five o'clock because you have crossed your own boundary and now they think it's OK to cross that boundary. So pay attention to what your boundaries are and then make sure that your behaviors align with your boundaries. So we've covered that A and that B. And then that C would be challenge. Challenge what is happening in the workplace and create change. And of course, when you're challenging, you have to have some emotional regulation, right? We want to bring in the emotions like Julius is saying. We want to see some of the, the passion and the power and the excitement when we're challenging, but not to the degree that it overshadows the message. 
So you want to be able to challenge what is happening in the workplace in a very emotionally aware and regulated way and create solutions for change. So again, going back to those ABCs, right, that advocacy of that based in awareness, those boundaries with behaviors that align with that and challenging with the, the overall goal of change. Thank you. That's great. ABCs. I'll remember that. You know, I'm a nerdy educator. It always has to come back to literature, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know, and I think that goes back, you know, to even how we started this, like, right, which is like, I think when, 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 when employees, right, they don't know how to hold their boundaries, right, and then all of a sudden, it's like way out of whack. And then they, it's like, they don't know how to kind of retrain themselves and the people around them to expect something different. And so I think what a lot of people end up doing is they end up leaving because they figure, well, it's just easier to kind of restart those boundaries somewhere else where I haven't set this precedent. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity to kind of assess, well, what if you just experimented where you were, right? Assuming like all things equal, right? Assuming you're in a healthy, you know, uh, work environment to say, okay, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start setting different boundaries. And I think that that, um, you know, that can, make a world of difference for people to realize you can do it where you are. You don't necessarily have to leave to to live your values and your beliefs now, especially because so many of those values and beliefs have changed over the past year and a half because we've all changed. Companies have changed. And now we're assessing who are we now, now that we know more about ourselves and what's really important to us. And then how do I take action on that in an environment where people are used to the old me, you know? I think boundaries, another word for boundaries are like setting rules or parameters. And part of the issue could be is that there are no rules or parameters in this new digital hybrid era where we're finding people are logging on an extra two hours a day and we're, you know, at least during lockdown home all the time. So you can send off an email at, you know, 9 p.m. at night. You can work on the weekend because, you know, people assume, oh, you, you can't go anywhere. Anyways, I think that's a huge issue is there's no boundary saying, you know, we don't send emails after this time. We don't do work on the weekend. And so it started to creep into all these crevices of our life. So yeah, we have been able to take walks in the middle of the day and, and that's been nice. But I think a lot of people are also working around the clock. And I, I'm wondering, it's hard to set boundaries as an individual employee. So do, is this something that has to come from leadership and what are some kind of creative solutions for making this sustainable? Yeah, I'd like to respond to that, Holly. I, you know, we had this uh, sort of archaic uh, phrasing of mandatory meetings in the workplace. And I think we need to start mandating play, rest and pleasure. Uh, during the work day, we actually mandate that our folks get an hour at least of self-care during the work day. So I literally want to go on your calendar and see when your weekly self-care hour is. So that is a signal to me and everybody else on the team, do not bother this particular staff person during this hour, because that is literally, you, you wouldn't try to call them if you saw that they were in a meeting with an investor during this time. So they're in a, they're in a, a, a meaning, probably the most meaningful meeting of all with themselves during this hour. So um, I think we need, I, I kind of jokingly said mandate pleasure and rest, but I think we need to have that kind of sort of outlook on it. Um, and from, you know, more of a zoomed out perspective, when we think of, of budgeting um, in our bottom line, we budget for everything else. We budget for technology. Uh, we budget for staff. We budget for, uh, you know, other items that are necessary for the success of our businesses and organizations. Uh, but very seldomly do we budget for play, rest, and pleasure as it relates to our, our staff and our team members. Um, I think that uh, managers, program directors, CEOs, executive level C-suite folks have to, be, have to become more intentional about saying, where is the money in our budget to pour into our people when it comes to uh, play, rest, and pleasure. And that is a part of our bottom line, right? That That is something that we can connect to 
revenue generation and retention and employee satisfaction. Um, I don't know what all what the data is suggesting at, up until this point, but it, it's it 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 can support all of those things in a very positive way. So um, we're trying to get more creative about that and being up being up front with investors and funders and donors and saying that hey, you know, some of your support will be used to to support the wellness of our people. It's like why is it easier? to get people to donate for us to support and take care of the wellness of others. But then we, when we say we want to take care of the wellness of the people who are doing the work, it's like, why would you want to do that? It's like, it's a, it's sort of this weird just position of like the same exact ask. Mm. And I, yeah. I think, you know, two, two pieces to this. I mean, one is, you know, as we look at, at how much, our jobs have changed a lot. Um, many people, the businesses had to pivot or the way that you work, you know, virtually versus in person has, has changed the, you know, context of your job. Maybe because of this great resignation and we're losing people within the organization, you've had to take on more responsibility that previously been on others' plates. And so this one aspect is that transparency of being able to say, okay, here's everything on my plate and I can only do so much and I need to either offload some or just not do it, right? That whole start, stop and keep conversation, I think is one that all businesses need to be having right now because your workers are just keep piling more on and more on and it's hard to set boundaries and it's hard to create limits when the to-do list is endless. But to that end, you know, something that we've uh, been doing at Elevate is is really experimenting with the four day work week. We saw that our employees were um, not taking enough time for for self care. Um, early on in the pandemic, we started this uh, Treat Yourself Tuesday, where we did a drawing every week, and someone on the team would get fifty bucks, and we'd say, "Take a day off and like treat yourself, like take that time for you." Even if we can't leave the house right now, you know, get a Netflix subscription or a book or, or order take it, whatever it is that will just help you just make that space for yourself. And it had such a positive impact on the team where it was just like, wow, I didn't know how much I needed that day. Me personally, when I when it was my Treat Yourself Tuesday, I was like, whoa, I needed that. So we started uh, every, you know, every other week is a four-day work week. I think that this is, again, looking at the structures and systems that our, our businesses are built on, counterintuitive to, you know, the 40-hour work week, and we need to be working these hours, and we need to be in the office. No. What we've found is as we've, you know, given our team that space to, you know, take for themselves their mental health, their physical well-being to, you know, not just, you know, have another, another weekend day full of activities, but this is a time for them. And it's really helped. They've said that they're more focused on the work they do those other four days. They're really happy in the office. They feel more engaged. Um, they have more clarity and space to think when they're not just inundated 24-7. And so those are things, too, where companies need to start exploring and get a little uncomfortable with that exploration. I'll be honest, as a, as a business leader who grew up during a time where FaceTime really mattered, um, it was hard for me to really lean into this. I was like, I don't know, what is the implications? But the research shows that this works and our own experiences show that it works. So, you know, as Dr. Coleman said, when we put the employee first in that human centric mindset, you start to say, well, what's best for them that will help them do their job at the best way that they can? And then how do I support that? And maybe that's changing business the way that we've known it. Um, but this is the time to do it. And it's an exciting way to move forward and to really show your employees that their well-being is top of mind. Yeah. And I don't have the research in front of me, but no one is productive all eight or nine hours of the workday. I think you need to take a break every 52 minutes. And the, the study in Iceland of going to the four-day work week showed people are working less hours and they are just as productive as before, we have a comment in, uh, I see in the comment section, so many companies are raising the pressure and demands, creating a culture of unrealistic expectations. And I think that's what people are, are struggling with. And maybe that's a huge part behind this great resignation is just the not being able to create the boundaries, not feeling like they can, not having the time, companies not giving them the time. Um, and to Julius's point, I love the, you know, the self-care hour. Um, I don't know the research on uh, self-care during the workday, but 
Uh, studies show that taking a vacation obviously makes you more creative, more production, productive, and there's also health benefits like lower risk of diabetes, lower risk of heart attack. That's incredible. So why are we still sticking to this structure? Well, and Holly, uh, you know, one, one quick add to all of this, like, awesome conversation. I just want to give everybody like a bear hug. Like, yes. Like if everybody just took one nugget from this conversation, like that's listening out there, we, we create a much better world working environment. But um, I, here's my thing, right? I think it comes also down to, we got to dig deeper on this boundary thing down to this idea of like, what is the business strategy and what are the priorities? Because I think what happens is when leaders aren't willing to make those tough choices, it just is going to roll downhill. And so companies have to really take a look at what are you really trying to achieve? And is achieving all 10 of those priorities really realistic? Or do you need to actually think differently about what you're doing in the marketplace and how you're going to do it to get better results? And so I think really getting to the fundamentals of business strategy will help um, get out of this spin. And I'm not saying it's easy and it's definitely new behaviors and new habits. But like, I think that will help um, with the workload and the unrealistic uh, expectations that are happening right now to, you know, to one of our viewers point. Yeah, I want to add to that, Tosca. Well, one of the things, and I know we're getting close to time here, that we didn't acknowledge that we can have an, an, a, another conversation on is the impact of the pandemic on directly on the workload, right? There are, a lot of organizations and, and companies that their workload drastically increased because they were excellent at what they do. They are excellent at what they do. So uh, the, the, the companies and organizations that were maybe downsizing and short staffed and losing people, somebody is picking up that responsibility. Some organization and company are, is picking up those clients and serving them to some degree. Right. And then what has to happen in that moment? You have exponential growth. You have to start hiring more people. You have one person who's now doing the job of three people or two people. So that that is having a direct impact on uh, the the mental, psychological, and emotional well being of each employee, and on the way that employers and our C suite executives are are uh, managing those priorities, as Tosca said. So like that that the demand that was placed onto a lot of, of organizations to do more and to sustain more in the midst of a global pandemic. I think we, we need to be assessing that and, and looking at how that impacted uh, folks and is can, will continue to impact our growing uh, and uh, the ones that are not growing, that are sort of going in the other direction as well. Absolutely. My thought around it, Holly, is that we need to get to the top a little bit faster, right? So. I recognize that our folks that are in our C-suite are often focused on business development and it's the managers and supervisors that are having the direct interactions with the staff. And so when we have these types of conversations or we come up with these kind of solutions, I'm not sure if, if the right people are necessarily hearing it. When we're talking about needing to make um, company and organization shifts, it needs to be some, it needs to be the shift in the mindset of of the CEO, of the COO, of the people who are thinking all the time and then, you know, delegating the information down. Uh, sometimes we get into this, this game of telephone, right, where some it, the information gets stopped somewhere and it, and it shifts and, and the right people don't hear it at the right moment. And so if we could start being creative around how do we get into in front of CEOs and start getting them to think about emotional intelligence. How do we get them to start thinking about um, the fact that their staff members are going through these existential crises, like you mentioned earlier, where they're trying to think about what is their purpose and what is their meaning and how does this particular job or career path align with their purpose and why they're on this earth? When we start getting CEOs to shift and not just thinking about business as or not just profit and revenue as the bottom line, but humans and the people that are working with them then I think we're going to see the shifts happen a lot greater. 
The challenge is, is that many CEOs are of the old school mentality in which they believed in face-to-face -face interaction and they believed in certain structures. And now we're recognizing that there's a cultural um, divide because a lot of the people who are doing the work are not of the same culture of the people who are running the business. And so there's this pushback. And so it's not just on the employee to make the shift, the organizations have to make the shift and they have to be wanting to make the shift. And so when we go back to the topic of the great resignation, what it's causing is a lot of CEOs to think, what is happening, right? Because I'm losing all of my people and now we're finally getting the attention of the CEOs to say, look at emotional intelligence, look at humanity, look at who these people are, their needs, their values, their experiences, and not just their skill sets. We are not robots out here. We are humans that have so much value to add to a business. And now we're finally getting their attention through resignations. So that's why I believe that some of these resignations are boundary settings. It's saying, hey, pay attention to me. Okay, you don't want to pay attention to me. I'm going to leave. And if enough people say that, we're going to get the attention at the top to be able to have these conversations so that they can listen in on top conversations like this. <laughs> well, let's hope that, yeah, there this does uh, create a transformation in the workplace. I know we only have four minutes left, and I wanted to end with an action step or takeaway um, for the people listening. But I'm a working mom, so this is an important question for me. I, I wanted to direct towards... Uh, Christy, um, so we're seeing women and uh, mothers in particular leaving the workforce at higher rates right now during the pandemic uh, with women of color and black women leaving at even higher rates. So I just wanted to get, you know, what what do you think we need to do to reverse this trend? <laughs> I mean, just do something. I mean, to be honest, do something, right? Uh, our, our workforce Workplaces don't uh, support working caregivers. Uh, that is a bold statement, but if you look at policy, if you look at the private sector and paid leave, um, and not just paid leave um, for you know maternity leave, there's caregiver leave. We have an aging population. We're taking care of parents um, and, and others as well. Um, we need space just to, to process and have space for ourselves too. So. We are in a place where stigma still exists. The stigma around, you know, who's able to show up, who can travel, who can put in the time. We live in a system that, again, wasn't built for women and particularly for people of color. It was built many, many, many years ago. Uh, and we need to disrupt that because it was built for, you know, predominantly white men who had the freedom and flexibility to go into the office, to travel, to put in that face time. Um, so, you know, the bigger thing is just have a hard look at um, your systems, your structures, who are you supporting, who is uh, represented in your leadership, who is represented within your organization, how are you creating the space uh, to really speak one-on-one -on -one and individually with those in your organization that are caregivers or people of color, to understand their lived experiences, I just saw a stat that 3% of people of color want to return to the workforce. And that is a stat that we need to look at and to shine a light on why that is. Because being in, uh, sorry, not return to the workforce, return to the office. Because there's so many um, situations that, and microaggressions, there's lack of support, lack of, you know, um, mentorship that is happening that don't make the office a, a hospitable place, a place where many of your workers want to be. And during this time where we've seen it in a different light, when we've seen you know, what can happen maybe when we're home, when we have space, when we're not exposed to microaggressions, we're able to you know, pivot between caregiving and working in a, in a way that better suits us. You're not gonna want to go back to that place that didn't see you, that didn't listen to you, and that didn't support you. So I think we've got a, a big issue here um, across the board. I mean, we can talk about the US policies on caregiving and beyond, but as an employer, as someone who has the ability and the power to listen to your workers, to create change and to create a system that works better for them, I implore you to do it. Now is the time to really step up, to lead by example and to show your employees that you care about them uh, and you care about their whole identity, not just, you know, Christy as employee, 
a Christie as human who has many hats and many responsibilities and will opt to be a caregiver beyond showing up for a workplace that um, doesn't care about me. Yeah. And caregiving has traditionally been undervalued because it's unpaid labor, but raising the next generation of leaders is such an important job and caring for the aging parents who cared for us is there's power and there's value in that. So thank well, you. I would say caregiving doesn't stop either. I mean, in, in the middle of the panel, I was getting, you saw me looking down. It was my kids texting me with some emergency. I mean, it doesn't end like our, our, we can't just leave those identities at the door. Um, mm -hmm. so we have to, you know, embrace that and provide the flexibility for people um, and, and our employees to really show up um, in the way that's, that makes sense for them. Yeah, um, we're getting so many great questions from the audience. I wish we had time to answer them. We're at time. Um, we'll, we'll try to respond to your answers in the comments just to let everybody know. Um, we'll write back to you. But uh, the last question I wanted to ask is, what's one action step that leaders of all levels can take, or, or micro progression, as we call it at Consciously Unbiased, um, to help people feel happier at work? Tosca, you want to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, first, uh, I just want to just say, right, like, like happiness, right, is an inside job, right? But I know what you're getting at, right? Um, look, I think that if if organizations are clear with their purpose and their mission and like why they exist and can really a live those values of why they exist and and give their employees the why, right? That can go so, so far in, in employees feeling like they're showing up for something that actually matters. That would be my, it's small, but it's like not small, if you know what I mean. But like be clear on your mission and communicate that and help people feel like they are a part of it so that they wake up saying, this is really what I'm here to do. Love that. Julius? Yeah, I would, I would echo some of that and uh, saying we need to be modeling uh, what it is that we're preaching. I think oftentimes we talk about things just from this external uh, outward facing lens of here's what we should be doing. Um, if I'm saying it and preaching it, but not living it and embodying that and, and emanating that same energy, energy is so real. Um, there have been numerous amounts of times where our team members have said, you know, uh, they, they've expressed to me the type of energy that I'm giving out, whether it be good energy, whether it be flat energy, wh wherever the energy is, your team and the people around you can feel it. So we have to, to really embody that healing energy, that uh, wellness energy, that happy, joyful energy, because it really is contagious. And I think it, it, it permeates throughout uh, the organizational and company culture as a result. Thank you. Christy? Yeah, I mean, my advice is just to get a little uncomfortable as leaders. Uh, we, you know, we need to get uncomfortable uh, in, you know, understanding where we're succeeding, where we're failing, and trying different ways to, to lead and to structure companies in you know being vulnerable to what's happening in this world and how it's impacting our workers in really thinking differently about business not just about the revenues and profits and pnl but about how our greatest asset our employees are driving that and how the more we invest in them and the more we support them the better holistically our business will be so i just think as a leader in this whole conversation as i've been listening i keep thinking that would make me uncomfortable, but it's time to be uncomfortable uh, because that is what's going to help keep our employees in the workforce, keep them within our organization and open us up to new possibilities. Thank you. Dr. Plummer. I don't have anything to add. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Right. That's so not me. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that um, I know that I feel happy and that my my staff and people that I interact with feel happy when they feel empowered. And generally that empowerment happens when, with two main things. One, when they have an opportunity to have a voice, 
which means that meeting times need to be extended just a little bit or agendas need to be shifted just a little bit so that you can hear from the folks that are working with you, where you ask them very direct questions that are related to their thoughts and their feelings and their behaviors. So very specifically asking for feedback so that they have a space to give a voice. And even with that feedback, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do what the staff member is saying, but you are open to hearing their ideas because they may have some wonderful ideas that makes them feel great. First, because they say it, and second, because you're listening, and then ideally because you can implement some of that. So shifting some of these meetings and these agendas so that the, the voices of your staff members can be heard. And then the second point would be giving people options. We are adults. People don't like to be told every single thing to do. They want to know that they have some options and that their decisions are trusted. So when you have big decisions and even small decisions to make in the company, get some feedback from the staff. Put a little survey out there. Go to the water cooler. Come in and have a quick Zoom call and get the information back. When we make decisions at Onyx, we go to our staff and say, you can you can do this or you can do this or you can present a third option. But I find that that makes people feel more invested in the company. They feel um, more engaged and they have a higher sense of morale, which means that they have, going back to Julius, that higher energy that comes back in their productivity, that comes back in the way they interact with their clients. So making sure that people feel empowered and heard um, and be and structuring that and also making sure that people have options, that they're not mandated to do everything, but that they can get to pick and choose certain things in, in the process. Mm. Thank you. That those are concrete takeaways. And I appreciate each of you and your insights and showing up here today. Um, to, to sharing for sharing your thoughts. So thank you very much. It was great speaking to you all. Have a great day. See you later. Bye.